Okay, so today we are talking about the fundamentals of motion and time, specifically the passage of time and how to um, show that. One of the issues that you uh, deal with immediately uh, in traditional art, um, always wants to do that there. Uh, one of the things that you have to deal with initially with traditional art is that it's inherently um, static or motionless. Um, and, and of course you can have, um, you know, art that has actual moving pieces to it, but if you're looking at, um, what, you know, paintings, drawings, pictures, the, the stuff that we, we think of as traditional art, um, you have to figure out how to show or imply, um, motion or even in passion uh, or, or passion passage of time um, and and that's can be difficult to do when um, you think about um, working with like traditional modes of art think about for example um, painting uh, right for for one type of example right so if you have a painting it's well static like most traditional art. It's something that um, uh, doesn't, it's, it's, it's a permanence that creates in this one fixed position that doesn't change over time. Now, just because that doesn't necessarily change doesn't mean that you can't then find, artists have to find right? Alternate ways to express um, motion or passage of time. Um, of course, we'll, we're going to look at um, what's called bio art um, at, at the end, and that is something that isn't traditional art and does actually change. Um, so you can, you can have real motion, real passage of time, okay? But we're going to look first, of course, at implied motion because of course that's what most of, of the art is. Just like all of the other aspects of implied that we've looked at, right? You're getting implied motion. It, may, it gives the suggestion of movement, right? And how you see that, there's a variety of ways that that can um, take place. We don't actually see right the the motion happening instead what takes place is that there will be a variety of visual cues if you will um that um essentially our brain translates into the idea of saying oh that's in motion so what are some of those uh visual cues if you will well the way that lines are, are used. We've talked about this with communication, right? That if you have lines drawn behind uh, a stick figure, that implies motion. And we know that because of experience. Again, a lot of these visual cues, uh, it is important to still uh, recognize that some of these are going to be based on experience uh, and, and what you've seen and then what you make that connection. Others are going to be replicating real world uh, ways of motion in exaggerated forms because that's certainly something um, I think we could put, let's actually put here that it, it can be um, oh, I want to keep it with visual cues. So we'll just change this real quick. Um, oops. Is often in, it doesn't like when I over erase there, often used um, with exaggerated, um, uh, uh, yeah, exaggerated form. Uh, it's, it's used with, um, It will say excessive um, motion cues, visual cues, uh, compared to the real world. So what I mean by this is that when you have a static um, picture that you have to do, um, 
and you only have visual cues um, to, to show that, one of the things that you do is that you um, over exaggerate or use excessive amounts of it compared to um, what you would see in the real world because ultimately right we're connecting what we know in the real world with these visual cues to make an assumption right of motion because our brain is telling us oh that that implies movement so again back to the visual cues sorry about that I wanted to make add that and, and it didn't work underneath so lines lines are one of those ways um, and they can be more simplistic or more complicated and we'll look at some examples here uh, you can have uh, multiple brush strokes so uh, and we'll, we'll see that as well um, um, those ones so it's easier to show um, contrasting textures can um, by having different textures or brush strokes that you have a sense that that things are not static and it, you can have implied motion can be very um, basic uh, or vague even to very very specifically showing um, that that idea that there's no one's going to mistake uh, that that isn't motion uh, position of the body is one that is uh, very common um, and probably one that gives away a lot. We looked at this with communication again too, but the way that you, uh, if you were drawing someone or sculpting someone, the position of their body is going to indicate um, if they're in a standing position or they're in the middle of motion because we know certain positions with a leg up or back or uh, in a position of jumping that you can't have that if you aren't in motion and so then we are naturally going to see that static image uh, as uh, showing motion and and immediately understanding that right blurring images uh, blurred images around an individual or um, thing or or animal um, implies usually this implies fast movement right so there you can imply different types of speed to expression on the face and this can be on people or animals if you're exerting yourself while ra don't run in a race you know if you <laughs> it would look funny if someone was like looked was in the body position of running and then their face looked very like calm and like they were doing nothing this can also be to if like the wind is hitting your face it, you're going to have um, some kind of distortion with that which is going to change the expression on your face and so all of that again connects to you know how what we would visually see if someone was actually in motion um, the shapes how shapes are used um, uh, can can give off different senses of motion um, and then you have multiple positions so for this one, and again, we're going to look at some examples of these things in just a second. Um, for multiple positions, if you um, take a photograph, like long exposure can sometimes show that, or you take multiple, the rapid fire photos, and then you put them all together in one photo. So you see, we're going to see an example of this with a golf swing. You see the golf club uh, in all of the positions that it, well, as, as many as the camera could take in that motion of swinging the golf club and then of course that then implies that that motion took place um, transformation transformation um, uh, we'll see in actually one of the first sculptures um, where something is transforming into something else um, which would imply that motion is taking place for that transformation to happen. Okay, so these are just some of the examples for um, that implied motion. So let's let's take a look. We have, I think the first one is, oh, this, well, this one was here, motion and art. Um, so this is the multiple positions. I talked about the one in a photograph, but here's one of, of drawing. So that you have... Um, uh, the you know starting point actually there's a few that got cut off but you still get the idea right he's doing a flip and so you get the implied motion even though each individual drawing sketch is static the act of putting the multiple positions together creates the implied motion that's taking place that 
even without showing the end part where he's landing, we know that that means that he was doing a flip. Here is the one I was talking about with um, uh, transformation. This is Daphne and Apollo. This one is um, in your um, textbook. And uh, this is with Greek um, sculpture, well, Greek myth. Um, so you have two couple things going on here. And, and here's the other thing. I gave you that list, right? Usually um, more than one is being used. Um, right, so that there's it doesn't have to be that only one type of a visual cue is being used. Uh, often, different types and methods are being used at the same time um, because that just further provides that uh, visual cues enough visual cues that the person viewing it is more likely to recognize it. If you're super subtle. Uh, I mean, and that might be the point to be very subtle about about those cues, so that maybe not everyone notices that their motion. There was um, and there was an interesting one. Um, it's the, actually the exact opposite of static art, right? It was a, a slow motion video, and they shot it in super slow motion. Um, and this was in an art gallery, and so this was the this the whole room was the uh, video medium. But what they did is they um, they put it on uh, in a way and framed it to make it look like a picture, a painting. And the person was painted, like their body was painted to make them look like a painting. And then they shot it in super slow motion and then probably had the person also moving really slowly so that you had to watch it for, it was about a minute uh, for any movement and it was just incremental little tiny movements that if you weren't paying attention and staring at it you might not notice unless you hung around in the room for five minutes and then was looked back more like whoa wait that wasn't in that position before so look there's the reverse of that right it's very clever of using something that's actual motion that artwork uh, that I just described is actual motion and yet it's replicating and implying static with implied motion. So very, very clever. It was, it was, you know, especially when you understand that, right? If you just looked at it, you didn't know what they're doing. You're kind of like, what's the point? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's reversing our expectations of what you expect to see with video. And then it's, it, and then in the process using actual motion for implied motion, like I said, so understanding the art and what they're doing can help you appreciate when artists do clever things like that because it's easy to walk past that and not get it um, simply because you don't understand the concepts that they're playing with and kind of being cheeky about in the process. Okay, so we have um, body position. That's one of the things that's going on here. Back to Apollo and uh, Daphne. And then you have uh, transformation. You also have facial expression, right? So they're doing a lot with the physical body. Um, you could argue, I mean, this is transformation here. Uh, you could also argue that this is the shapes and lines as well. More shapes than lines. Um, because this uh, cloth, it applies with the way that this is going out, right? Is implying that there is movement to make the cloth flow like that. But then it, the same thing, right? The feet and how they are, the arms, that's implying motion. They don't, you don't stand like that if you're standing straight. That doesn't work. Uh, and then you've got her facial expression, which looks like she's in a movement while it's going with the transformation. But it's implying, though, that she isn't just sitting there passively, just chilling. Um, and then you have the physical transformation as she's being changed into a tree. So this is part of Greek myth. There's a story with this. Um, there's a couple different versions of the myth, but one of them is that she's being pursued by Apollo. Apollo um, and there's another one where it's a different girl. And in order to, uh, she, she prays to the goddess Artemis to save her. Uh, from Apollo um, because he he's interested in her and she's not and uh, the Greeks he kind of don't refuse gods so she prays to Artemis another god to save her and in order to do so uh, she uh, turns her into a weeping willow tree technically saving her from either a hunter uh, and just a random guy in one of the myths or Apollo in another one um, uh, but probably not the saving that the uh, um, 
the woman asked for. <laughs> it's also why, like, the idea of weeping willow, that she's crying. Right, so the Greek, well, when we, we get to the Greeks and stuff, you know, we only got a, a few more weeks of fundamentals, and then we're going to be looking at the cultures and stuff. When we get to the Greeks, I really have really interesting stories with all of their art, um, because a lot of them are rooted in those types of myths. Okay, so just the point, right, of, like, that there's a variety. You have four. You probably could come up with a couple more smaller things that are being done here, but these are the four main ones that are being used to imply most um, and and that you see it isn't just usually one or the other so here this one is blurring the image it also is multiple um, well multiple positions so here okay so right here's here's where you see you see a couple different parts the leash uh, it looks like the whole dog is vibrating right I mean you could do this so you could look at the whole dog is vibrating the leash You've got a position here, a position here, a position here, and then these, it's small, right? Uh, and they're actually implied lines. I'm making them whole lines, but they're implied lines. And there's a use of implied line to create a sense of that it's moving back and forth really fast. And so you're getting to see that. Same thing with the blurring, right? So we've got a blurred image by especially you don't just, I mean, you, the, the whole dog is, is got a little bit of a, a blur to it. Um, but it's, it's definitely emphasized on the feet and the leash. And, and that's intentional because I was going to write leash by the feet. Um, because those are the areas that you expect to see the most movement from that the body and the head could be moving too, but it's not as much. So you have a blurred image, you have multiple, uh, positions with the tail with the leash right oh, blurred images often imply faster movement as well it doesn't always have to but the majority of the time if you see stuff like this it's meant to imply that a little dog with the little legs is walking super fast um, and and even the woman like I drew over it here see all of the feet position right and then you have body position because if you look again i have to i highlight and then erase so you can see you have one you one foot you have multiple feet but that's the one foot here and then you have this other one that's going up right and so that position of the foot upward motion body position like that is implying walking the dog, right, is, uh, well, wiener dog, so they don't have, a, like, super long legs. And even other dogs, if you watch how they walk, they don't walk in the same way that we do. Um, and so you have some body position, but it's not as obvious on a dog unless they're in a, um, like, if a pointer was pointing or in the moment of running, that would be, which is, this is what that's trying to apply. You could change the body position. But with people, it's really easy to position a, a foot up or a leg up, and that's almost immediately going to attach with someone that they're walking. So it doesn't take much to imply motion. I think that's the kind of key with it, too, is it's, it, it's not hard. Uh, to imply motion. What is uh, more difficult or certainly shows more craft is the variety of ways that they use it. And the better that you do, uh, you use it for whatever point you're trying to get across with art, the more realistic or the, uh, the more that someone's going to be in tune with what you were trying to do with that implied motion. Um, so blurred image, multiple positions, body position, um, lines, right? We talked about the implied lines that are, that are taking place there. That's um, a big part of it. You could, uh, it looks like there's some cross hatching going on too, but that's still lines. Um, and you could, um, this could also be done by multiple brush strokes. So if you, depending on the type of material, um, whether you were painting or drawing, um, this is easy to create um, the different brush strokes with it as well. But again, lots of different methods. So, but, but very different. Right here, it's, it's, there's no blurring whatsoever. It's very much focused on, and, and again, it's two people versus an animal and feet but that you have completely different techniques being used between the sculpture and um, the dog on leash, as the title of this is. Now, here we have, we're going to have two horse ones. Um, and, and that, 
the there tends to be a lot of horses in motion. I think if you look at art with horses, rarely are they just chilling in the field. There, it's more uh, dynamic to see them in uh, motion. Um, so what you have here is all over the place body position um, going on, um, facial expressions both in people and uh, the horse, right? That, that face right there with the eyes and the mouth uh, should definitely be giving away that it's in motion, but if not clear that this position of, of the legs um, is, and the fact that you have different body positions, and that's important too. Um, you know, you could put that um, with body position, but it's one to have one body position. Each one of these horses and people, although if you notice what's interesting is the focus and emphasis, and so we're gonna talk about focal point and emphasis uh, soon, um, is not so much on the people. And look at their positioning. Uh, most of them are in the same position, body position. But the horses, are all in different positions with this one being the focal point. So the emphasis of this painting is not the people, although you can notice them. Um, it, it really is first front and center looking at that horse and then you moving outward and backward towards other horses and eventually you kind of look up at the people. That's also intentional for what they're wanting to uh, emphasize in the process as well. Um, so again, different body positions um, and um, so body position, but then specifically different multiple in terms of not multiple um, like the one we saw where it's the same animal with a tail, but that you have all of the same animal, the different horses. They're all different horses though, but they're all displaying multiple or different body positions. Um, to, to express that it's all the horses are in motion. And if you don't get it with the, this one here, which you should, you get it with all, you get it reinforced over and over again that the horses are moving. Shadow can also imply, actually, interestingly enough, shadow can imply, and I didn't write that one down, I'll add it. Shadow can imply a uh, passage of time and, and often does, but it also can imply movement based on how the shadows are playing out. Now that tends, this is definitely more of a subtle um, uh, aspect in terms of, of let's, let's say you are less likely um, to notice because of it being so subtle in movement. Um, but it does play a role. And then you have a little bit of blurring here um, we'll put blurred, um, image, but this is small in comparison to the, the rest and, and blurring, right? Just the idea of either. So there's two things that this can be. One is that you're just moving so fast. You don't see it clearly. The other is that potential for, well, it's kicking up dust or other things, which then is leaving this kind of blurred motion, uh, a visual in the process. Um, and then, I mean, the people, his position here, um, does suggest that he's, the horse is moving, but again, it's not so much that he's moving because the, the, clearly they're all kind of in the same position. Uh, this guy is moved forward more, which would imply more, um, he's kind of hard to see because of the color, but if you look at his body angle, right, versus this one which is just slightly back, um, this is going to imply more motion, the forward motion on with a horse than, than the central horse and, and person. Okay, so here's another horse photo or, or pit, pit image artwork. It's not a photo. Um, and uh, here we have a little bit different. This one's more ambiguous, and that's where you have um, the blurred image you do have the body position. We'll say body positions. Um, the facial features aren't as obvious as the previous one. 
Um, but the idea is to create this sense of that they're running and and that there's movement because of of kind of the so not giving a full picture of it but then it's re it's emphasized with of course the body position of the horses you also have some use of um, that uh, contrasting texture from what the horse is to the background and i would argue shapes as well where you have this um, well actually it's in two spots right you've got these these dots around in the background to reemphasize that uh to the blurred component but also creating a sense of things moving but they're also using uh, um, little aspects of shape in the horse although let's go let's stick with that's more um um what would be contrasting texture but it ends up looking somewhat shape-like in how it's there you could also argue with the positive and negative shape so i'm going to leave it in with the horses too so again even when looking at something and going oh that's also there oh that's also there because a lot of the time you glance at it and you're like okay uh blurred image and body position is more obvious but then you start looking at it deeper and you realize that they're doing multiple things to get that implied motion here's the one i was mentioning with uh, multiple positions uh, where this is an, a photo and so you have the golfer here and then it took you know rapid uh, uh photo with uh essentially getting either they they did it were able to do it i'm pretty sure there's the shutter speed that allows for you to get that um uh and so that you you end up being able to see the um golf club in um uh, most angles and i mean you could do this by taking multiple photos of those angles or just having um, the long exposure would create this uh, as well on top of that you have blurred uh, image where this implies what's what's interesting with this is they did two things that are contrasting the blurred image is meant to show faster movement which is a golf swing is uh pretty well should be pretty quick movement but then you have these um the multiple positions um or so multiple positions but we should add another one with that because it's also multiple ob um, of the same object so you have multiple positions of the golfer right so that's the golfer itself but then you have um, multiple images of same object in different positions right so it still is multiple positions but it's kind of a subset more importantly oops go back the golf clubs are relatively clear right why are they not blurry but then what looks like the arm and hand yep the arm and hand which you also see multiple hands right um why is why have the um arm and hand or the hand actually that's probably the hand the whole most of the way through yeah it is why are the hand and part of the arm i'm being nitpicky here whatever part of the the hand oops the hand and definitely part of the arm is is blurry why have that but then uh, uh, emphasize the golf club as clear well you get um two different aspects of both uh this kind of uh fast and and slow um like kind of incremental movement uh, in the process it also works with lines because the the golf club itself creates this sense of lines i mean they're doing it for the style as well because it creates this kind of cool spiral look we remove that first part here look at it so it creates this spiral look where you have where you can't you have this void um that then it looks like the golf clubs are just hanging in the air 
So you can play with both fast and and uh, what what isn't implying quick motion, um, and we still can make that connection between the two. Um, and then you have body position, right? The position that you're seeing, right? This is definitely like a golfer's swing position, which implies motion. Um, but so that you can have both blurred and clear objects in uh, showing motion um, to kind of create a contrast between fast movement and the object that you're kind of focusing on, which is the golf club, um, and then the way that it creates this spiral, which would also be uh, somewhat of implied motion in the process as well. And we don't have any kind of, we can't see the face, we can't see um, uh, differences that way. Uh, when you use positive and negative uh, shapes, that can also uh, highlight aspects. So by uh, having nothing behind the golfer, you also get this element of focus on just the movement that's taking place. Um, all right, so that's, those, are, those are some examples of implied motion. So hopefully though you saw the variety of ways that it can be used. Um, that, that a lot of the times it isn't just one style, um, but that they're using multiple ones um, to, um, let's see, we'll discard that, to reinforce what they want. So I think the other one I mentioned I was going to, stop telling me that, <laughs> I need to obviously disconnect that. Um, Okay, what we're what was I gonna say with the added one? Oh, shadow, right? The more subtle aspect, but shadows can play a, a part in that. So the next one uh, is illusion of motion, which is also implied emotion. Um, so let's let's put it under implied motion because we're still not on actual motion, but under uh, implied emotion. You can have a, the illusion of motion, which is a little bit different um, because they can, what, what can be done is that artists can um, essentially communicate the idea of motion um, by creating what's more seen uh, an illusion than just simply the, the the visual cues we were looking at. In this case, it's visual tricks um, that essentially deceive our eyes. So the uh, ones that we just looked at uh, are not deceiving our eyes. Um, it's they're just visual cues to tell us that that's in motion. And we pick up on that because that's what we see when we see various things in motion. But illusion of motion, it's visual tricks that then deceive your eyes. Um, and so that you end up um, believing um, there is motion. And, um, and, and often, the more you look at it, um, the more it appears that there is motion, even though there's not. So there's two um, to, to look at that we're gonna see. This is often called, but not always, we're gonna look at one that's an optical illusion specifically. And an optical illusion, um, the first one we're gonna look at is, is look at is not an optical illusion, but it is, um, I mean, you could argue because optical is with the eyes. It is an illusion. But then there's the very specifically optical illusion art um, that specifically targets um, the um, movement of the human eye. So, movement of the human eye. The, the illusion of motion um, is that you can have one where it kind of tricks you into thinking it's moving, but it's not actually physically messing with, with how your eye works. And then you have optical art where it actually is um, messing with your eyes to make you think that it's moving. And, and the, the optical art usually makes my eyes water. 
um, which is a dead giveaway than that it's the optical art. What it's doing is that artists with these are usually using a sharp contrast. And I mentioned that with the contrast in textures or colors, right? And hard edges. And this then, um, and you ha it has to be, and um, uh, we'll say set close together. It has to be really close together. If you did sharp contrast and hard edges, but you had really wide gaps in between, it doesn't work. It has to be close enough um, together with all of those things because then what happens is our eyes cannot compensate um, uh, uh, between the individual lines. And so you're constantly, basically your eyes constantly jutting back and forth between, even if you don't feel it, trying to discern the edges and the lines, but because they're so close together, um, that constant attempt of your eye trying to figure out what's going on actually makes it then perceive as um, motion. And the longer you look at it, the more it messes with your eye. And which is why then like my eyes would water when I'm looking at that. So the eyes, um, cannot compensate uh, for um, what the, it, the, its own movement of w trying to discern, we'll say decipher um, the lines. Um, and so, like I said, that's the one you get. So let's look at the two. We have two um, examples from this. And I think both these are in, in, in the book. This is the first one. This is illusion of motion. And so you'll see the difference between the optical art where it's really messing with like the actual physical aspects of your eye and what our human eye can perceive versus um, this illusion of motion um, because of this um, one, the illusion of motion, and I'll add that, the setting and um, the uh, object that's used plays a huge role in the illusion of motion because we know what we, so if you didn't know what this is you might not perceive it in the same way there's a couple things that are going on with this one it's the the angle of actually let's start with that the angle of which the picture is taken right the photo is taken looking up the next thing is that you have the angles or the uh, circular aspect of the building. And so it appears in this kind of spiral shape, not like that at all, but the spiral shape going up. Then you have these words on it following that spiral scrolling shape. And the fact that, I mean, that's what the word comes to is scrolling then get triggers the illusion that these words are scrolling by but it is also an experience because generally speaking if you see this in real life these world these words if they were actually there would be scrolling so you already illusion of motion often plays with our assumptions of 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 the setting and object so let me add um that because i think that's important to add there oh, every time all right sorry i didn't turn that off and so it, it wants to keep adding that um the illusion of emotion well you can do both here here we go put it here um plays with our assumptions about setting and um, objects uh, and so that it doesn't have to actually mess physically with the eye but you you have that usually then also um, they employ as we saw with the, the scroller right is that um, the angle the angles um, that are used are important in this you rarely will see um, the illusion of motion in the way the first one, let's say the angles that are used are, um, are, what was I going to say with that, are specific, I went on, 
and important to the illusion. You won't really ever see one of the, um, the like the first one where it was like straight on. You uh, often are, in, are intentionally using angles that help reinforce that assumption. And this definitely works towards that. Okay, so then let's look at the optical one. And if you stare at this long enough, right, um, <laughs> that you, it doesn't, it takes like almost immediately for me that the, the harsh contrast between the colors, the closeness of the lines, that it, it almost feels like it's, it's not only wavy, but kind of pulsing um, as well. And this, these are the same ones, you know, they used to have posters um, um, probably before your guys' time um that uh the idea was you cross your eyes and then you uncross them and then you get the uh, um the optical illusion of of certain not only movement but shapes um and the, it was messed with your eyes just straight up looking at it but there was like an intentional aspect of if you closed your eyes for for a certain amount of time and opened them or crossed your eyes and then open and then uncrossed them it looked that 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 further physically messed with the how, the input in your eyes and what you were seeing and perceiving so that's optical illusions or optical um art right illusion slash art that's what you see with this um okay so that's that though that goes with um implied um motion now we're going to, every, I guess every time I go back and forth, it's going to want to do that. I apologize for that being in there. Um, the next is, so that was C. We'll go to D then. Of um, a, a mix of actual and implied motion. So the, the one that we're looking at next is not just actual motion, but it's combining some actual, actual and implied. So it's using both to create a sense of real um, motion. Okay, I think I fixed, hopefully we're not getting more of those <laughs> notifications. Um, okay, so act, actual and implied motion. Um, this tends to fall under um, what it starts with of uh, stroboscopic motion. And there's a variety of, of these. So um, basically this stro the stroboscopic motion is the idea of when you uh, see two or more um, repeated images. in quick succession, quick or rapid. It's more like rapid than just quick, but that's, that's a small separation there. Um, and so what happens is then they tend to um, visually fuse together. And this suggests, basically what it creates is it uh, creates what looks like motion. It, it creates the, it looks like actual motion. That's the importance, right? The implied motion um, doesn't look like actual motion. We just know that that's representing motion. This structure actually makes it look like it's actually moving um, but it's still technically implied because it's not actually moving but you have actual movement in the devices itself right so this part is the implied motion that with the actual motion of the um, device used uh, for these these and we'll look at a couple of them right together 
right, you get then the illusion, and because it goes back to it, because we, this could be actual, implied, and illusion of motion. Um, so we'll add that. And illusion of motion. So it's really three different components of it working together. Um, that then you get creates the illusion of motion. Okay, so the very first one of these um, that, let's see, here we'll go right here, that was created was the uh, phoneticoscope, phoneticoscope. Um, and this was, it's definitely the oldest for that. Um, you had what was uh, kind of a, a spindle viewer. And a lot of these require, we'll see, um, uh, small slits um, to view through, right? It's going to be where you have um, small lines to view through uh, and usually of solid color and part of that is because right this is going to create the contrast needed to create with the actual movement the illusion um, this was invented this specific one that we'll look at in just a second in 1832 um, and you had um, drawings on one side of a disc, and this is actually, it was a, it's a disc. And then uh, you have them separated by lines that are even, that's not even close to even. And then the image is on um, the individual ones. And so then when you look through the viewer, which the viewer was another slotted disc, um, essentially if like this was one of the discs, and then you had the disc with the image, and then the person would look through it and then it's spinning in the process. So if you just looked at it flat, right, this is at best implied motion. At best, because there's some implied motion by the positioning, okay? But then you have actual movement and together, it creates the illusion. Now, the video I'm going to I had on on Canvas and the one I'm going to show you here real quick. They, in order to to film it right, you don't see this first one, the first um, viewer. Um, okay, so let's see. The you have uh, drawings on a circular disc with. Um, we'll say lines separating each image. And with that, each image is in a slightly different position, which is important. If it was not in a slightly different position, you wouldn't have that. Um, illusion of, of motion. It would just be the same thing. It's chilling there. And then the viewer, as we mentioned, looked through the um, slotted disc. And the um, the illustrated one Um, well, and it depended on the device. The very first one, this was the only one moving, and another one you had both moving together. But the illustrated one in the original um, was spinning. 
and later both moved. Um, and so then right you get a repeated uh, scene where um, the drawings appear to be moving. To be in. So th this is the start of like animated films. This is the very early start of it. Um, right, that, that, that we're, you know, you're not, um, not anywhere close yet, but it definitely, this, this is the roots of like Disney, for example. So let's, let's take a look at this. Um, another example of, of this type of, of motion. And we're not gonna watch the whole thing, but I'll, I'll just show you a few, right? So you can take a, a look at the discs and just know that, um, the, the disc and what you're seeing, right? We're only seeing the actual drawing disc because they're, they're filming it. So you're not seeing what you have to view through to If you just took a disc and you didn't have the viewer, the viewer is essential. You, you're not going to get the same result. It requires both parts to create that illusion, uh, in order for it to work. Okay, so you get the idea there um, of um, uh, how some are more um, complex than others, right? Where you have uh, a lot going on. There's one that was just a dot and it looks like a bouncing ball or shapes. Or you have these more elaborate ones um, that, that can actually, one of the spaceship one like kind of went into the, the other part. Um, and so it does... Um, vary and and how detailed and complex it can be. Ah, I thought I had gotten rid of that. All right, I guess not. <laughs> have to figure out the setting because I thought I turned it off. Um, from from here, um, you have um, a, there's there's a various versions of these. Um, let's see what we're on with that. The E. So we'll go with up here. Um, there's one that then where you, you can look in the mirror, you could actually technically do this with like a plate and cut it out and then you could spin it and look in the mirror and that would work too with, if you had the viewer, um, they did one later with like reflection of light. Um, that was, that was the, that's so that the mirror works in the same way. They just did it where they actually had a candle and then, um, a, re uh, a cover that reflected back onto it, um, for the light. Um, but you, you could do it with the mirror too. That was like the next version. Then you had the zoetrope, which is a modified version, um, and it, it uses the same principles as um, the um, the original uh, in in many ways. Um, in in terms of really um, the lines and the, um, the pictures are function the same way, but instead of a circular disc, right? This one used a long strip 
of paper. And then again, you still needed the line separating help. You, you technically don't need them, but it's helpful. Um, the images. And then you have the um, viewer to look through. But it looks different. Uh, so in this one, it usually had like a little base that it was set on. And actually, I have a, like the toy one um, that in the next, I was going to show you in the zoom, you know, well, we'll look at it next time. And then it has this um, device kind of like that, that has the slits in it. Uh, they, the more elaborate older ones were made of wood. Um, and, but this one's made out of plastic. And so it goes all the way around like that, right? And then inside what you do, should have made it like that, but it goes, so the, the lines go all the way around and then this thing spins, right? So you, you spin the, uh, black part. This is, and this is almost always black because again, contrasting colors, we saw the contrast, right? um, makes a difference in it, it popping and standing out. And then you had this strip where then the lines were going here and you would do your image. Let's do the dot, right? So it looks like it's going up in the air. Oh, and then it's starting to come down and flattens. I can't have, you know, only one per thing. And then it starts to rebound, right? And then it's coming back down. And then what you do is you fold this that way so that the image is uh, in it goes, the image goes inside. Um, what it, would that be called? Like the container, we'll say. Um, and, and so that the, you fold this into its own circle, right? Where we see the image all the way around that way. And that goes on the inside here. And then you, once that's in, you just spin this and you look through the slits. So very similar concept, but a slightly different execution of it. Um, and then think about like from here, right? Other iterations, the flip book is a much more modern version of, of the same thing. Um, of these, and then we'll look at that in just an example. And then of course, um, animation. Animation is the kind of uh, additional step, although you could argue, right, cartoon animation, you could argue that digital animation is that, that final iteration. But if we're looking like early, think about like Disney and stuff, um, Disney grew out of this, grew out of these um, earlier devices. And, and the original Disney, and I, I put a video up for you on that. Um, they, before computers, right, they had to take, um, you had multiple images that uh, were filmed in uh, basically, uh, stop motion and then sped up to uh, create movement, right? And they had to do this, um, if you watch the, um, the video I put up, um, they have like the special screen technology where it could have different depths and so then you could put different backgrounds and then you're, you're filming in really slow speed, like, like stop motion. Um, it's not stop motion, right? It's like stop motion. 
uh, to create those different scenes, but the artist had to draw thousands of images of the characters, of the backgrounds. I mean, it's insane the amount of work that early Disney animation had to do to create the um, illusion of, of actual motion. Uh, later turns into um, computer generated, which is uh, a lot of work too, but far easier. You think about like the artists in these early periods, the artist um, was essential. You had people that were just that, the, so you had the characters, but then you had people that were only plants. Uh, artists. You had people that were only background artists and because they had to be consistent, um, they had to be accurate, um, in, um, the, the consistency of each drawing with slight changes to suggest that movement. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredibly impressive. You should definitely watch the little video I added to some, um, one of the original ones I posted, I added to other videos of how Disney had to compile individual frames that were hand drawn. Um, and, and then with computer generated animation, you're able to copy and paste and add stuff in a lot faster uh, way. There's still a ton that goes into it and it's still a lot of work, but just the, the level of artistry that these early um, animations did were just very, very impressive. I mean, even if you think of, of movie or motion picture, right? It, movie is just an abbreviation uh, for, um, um, motion or moving picture. Or motion, right? Picture. And that's what all of these things that we've been looking at are. Um, of course, eventually, um, what movie actually becomes with, with the non, -com like, uh, animated stuff. Our, our film, it's filming at, at just a, actually even a, a faster rate where you're getting the actual movement. Um, but real actual movement takes place not in film um, in the same way as like a performance, like Cirque du Soleil or a play or something like that. Um, film still technically in movies falls under this iteration. But let's look at the flip book um, because I think this is really fascinating. This guy is amazing. Um, in his flip books. This is a compilation of some of his, his best flip books. So think about what we've looked at and talked about for how to make this type of illusion of emotion and how the flip book replicates that, but in a, in a, in a different way, right? Instead of with like a disc and spinning, you're manually flipping the pages in the flip book, but it's still producing the, the fundamentals are the same. Nope, and then I get an ad. <laughs> it wasn't there when I set this up. Today's video is a compilation of... Oh, hang on. Hi, guys. Today's video is a compilation of some of the flipbooks that I have made over the past couple years. Um, I'll also put links to each of the full videos in the description box below so you can see the making of for each one. Hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you at the end. And there goes my, my internet.
Okay, so that last one, um, it, it doesn't show it clearly, but if you watch that, um, I'm sure there's going to be another notification coming up here in just a second. Yep. If you watch the, um, um, the making of, that's like 800 pages, just that last one, um, compilation that he did of the grumpy cloud where he expanded upon it. So just imagine the level of work that it goes into that. If that, that alone was 800 pages, little cards to do that short little scene. Um, right. So you think about with hand versus when you, you move to, um, uh, the, um, computer, how much that actually saves, uh, in time. Um, okay. So then actual motion, um, I think this is under motion. Implied. Oh, I got larger here on this size. Oh, well, um, here, we'll do actual motion. I've been having trouble with technology this week. All week, it seems like it's struggling. The, the struggle is real. Um, so a lot of time, right, um, actual motion is something that uh, uh, changes over time. Um, that isn't something that can be repeated or static. So... be exactly repeated. Um, because um, it, it technically a movie isn't uh, actual motion. Actual motion is something that um, uh, changes over time and uh, has a, you have objects physically move, and often like visual uh, performances and things that have motion, that it um, exists in a specific time in space. So this can be where you have performance art. I don't know how I got to F. This can also be um, um, kinetic art, which is moving sculptures. Okay, and then we're going to look at, lastly, um, passage um, through time, right? So, um, specifically with time, but how, how to show um, the passage of time in art. Now, with time... Um, again, you have the same kind of issue with, um, how to show in a static work that, that things are happening over time. Um, and anything, so one of the things is anything that deals with uh, events, it all has to, to show how that time goes by. Um, and usually there's a variety of ways to communicate that. Um, and, and, um using the same kind of um, cues, visual cues, um, and, and styles um, to express that. So we'll say ways of showing passage of time. Okay, and for that we have, um, so there's a variety of things that work with that. Um, a series of events is, is one of the um, probably most obvious ways where you have um, on the same, we'll call it page, right, or setting, canvas, whatever, you, you know, you want to call it in that sense. Um, when you have a, when you're showcasing a, a, a series of events or a variety of events, that, that uh, will, will work that way. Uh, showing... <laughs> Showing a clock or multiple clocks um, with different times. This can, um, so multiple clocks with different times or a clock um, that uh, has like a spinning uh, implied motion to it. 
right? So if you have the faces look like they're spinning really fast or you have multiple positions on the faces, that's like a in your face passage of time. And most artists don't use that very often um, or an hourglass. If you see an hourglass in art, if you see a clock in art, that can be a visual cue that they're trying to express passage of time. But it's definitely more an in-your-face kind of a version. Um, you can also have changing features. Features. Um, so changing, changing features. Um, for example, a plant in um, different stages of, of life, right? Could, could express the seasons. Or a tree where you see the leaves in um, different colors, um, which is another one. Changing uh, color. Um, and, and shade can indicate passage of time. Um, a rapid uh, swirl of lines um, can indicate um, that. Um, so, but this, this goes into, again, lines and blurring. And we'll look at, but it's specifically usually shaped in this where you have, um, where it's a circular motion of, of rapid swirl. And the reason for that tends to be because there's this idea of speeding up or like when you would fast forward through something or speeding up, they tend to show that in um, uh, images and videos and movies and things like that, where that is an indicator of that. Or you think of like Star Wars and um, when they go to, um, uh, or, or either a Star Trek too, where they both, when they're jumping to warp or whatever they where they're doing with that or light speed, um, you, you get kind of that visual representation of that. And then that tends to indicate movement, but also passage of time. Swirling though, tends to be more a passage of time versus the others can be both. Um, and this sense of like that somehow time's getting distorted and moving around. Um, the, uh, what was it called? The Twilight Zone used this uh, as that kind of um, representation. And then shadows. I mentioned the shadows before. Shadows, if you have changing shadows, that, that's an easy way where it's more um, subtle in motion. Sh shadows are a much more obvious thing in passage of time. Okay, so let's just look at this. The, the idea of passage of time, right, is, is that there's a variety of ways to just communicate this idea of, of showing, not that the person, that there was just movement, which often implies just right at that moment, but that, that this is something that's taken over time. The other way, um, and the last one is going to be bio art. We'll look at that too. Bio art, where it uses um, actual passage of time so that um you use we'll see there's they do ones with um it's not germs but like they do the little petri dish and they swab stuff on it and then it grows but they put it in a way that does art and i'll show you those in a second and and there's both additive um or subtractive so think of the ones with the the petri dishes and and germs is additive because it grows with time um, and then there's bio art with um, although you could use it with um, ice like ice sculptures would fit into this too they melt over time and so then that's subtractive right the less of it you have the more time has passed where at the additive bio art the more you have of it but this and, and so we'll look at those okay so let's just take a look at these for um, passage of time. Oh, and I had a couple pictures of the other ones I was talking about. Here's a finescope, right? So you can see you have the viewer here and then um, you have the reflection of these here individual discs and it spins. This is the zoetrope, the, the different position and the images are on the inside and this part spins here. Um, and then animation stills, what we're talking about, right? Where you're drawing a whole bunch for either a flip book or for our, um, you know, cartoons. So the passage of time right here, you have multiple uh, photos. So multiple images 
and then you have each image uh, has a different season basically. And so over the pictures you get with the same object of the same object. It, you, this doesn't work if you don't use the same object. If you have multiple images of the same object where it's then showing different seasons, which doesn't have to be obvious and, and it could be of colors which represent the season, is going to have a natural passage of time. And this is definitely using like that a sense of, of natural time. Right, that's nature and the season. Same thing here, we get a passage of time from uh, the hole to when the wind blows and slowly the, those, those weed things disappear. Right, and so this is implying with each image that time is passing for that to happen. Here you have um, this one, which is the um, a series of events. So this is the meeting of um, Saint Anthony uh, with Saint Paul, and the the ones where you have a series of events. These are storytelling, okay? So that these are almost always telling a, a, a story in the art itself. Um, and this one, they're using distance. They're also using the um, background and foreground, which is um, positioning, right? We looked at those. So that um, this is the end point. That's the end of the journey. Here's the start. And you can guess that, besides if you didn't know the title, um, because uh, this is in the foreground and it's larger, this, they're also using size, right? So there's a lot of fundamentals we learned that there are, you're using in here to portray passage of time. So he's here and it, you have this path and actually, well, it goes behind the tree, right? So it goes in, back into this forest, and then he finally meets him. And so he starts out here, and he's making his journey. And it also, you look, colors, you have what looks like slightly darker sky in the background, darker colors back here. He's going through. And then you see, uh, this is a mythical creature, um, the centaur, um, which was a symbol of um, temptation. Uh, they were usually connected to Bacchus in Greek myth, who was the god of excess um, and drink. So he's going on his journey to meet St. Paul, and along the way he's met by temptation. Uh, and then you see this big path here of this deep, dark forest, but, um, you know, it's not, it, it's so dense you don't see anything in it, which would also suggest um, that time in the sense of just believing what it would take to get through that and then finally he ends up meeting uh, St. Paul uh, in the closest one and so it was meant to symbolize not only the story of his journey but the temptation and difficulties that it took to get to that point. So it's, like I said if you see a series of events in a single artwork that usually is going to have a story attached to it so just be aware of that um, and that you're looking for more of that. Here you have um, uh, the sun used to create art and also show passage of time. This is called a solar rotary and this design and what you see down here changes depending on the position of the sun which then also is indicative of a passage of time. You could also argue that like a sundial right is um, that's showing us passage of time too. Um, and this is just an art installation sundial in that process. Here's what I mentioned with the swirls or the, the circular arching swirls. It's this idea of the background is spinning and moving. And this has to do with the rotation of the earth too, right? I didn't mention on the other part, but like the idea of if you speed up the rotation of the earth into the super fast time, that's what you'd see if you, if somehow where you were standing and the object stood still <laughs> um, uh, um, right it, it's that's that's the implication from it so anytime you see um, 
this type of background, it can end up meaning and implying a passage or of, of time. It doesn't always, but it's something to pay attention to. Here's bio art. This is the last part of what we're looking at. Bio art. Using biology, physical stuff, to imply passage of time. So here you have a book, and it's seeds growing on the book, which indicates, right, old and growth. Uh, and so it's that, ad this is definitely the additive, right? It's that you get art and it changes. This, this is, again, this is the actual, like, passage of time versus implied passage of time, which I didn't indicate in there, but there is both, implied and actual. Here is actual passage of time has to take place in order for this to develop and create, right? And it changes over time. It actually changes over time. Bio art is going to have that actual component, whereas the one we looked at with St. Anthony meeting St. Peter is implied, or the, um, the, um, the solar one is actual passage of time. But it's also implied in the sense of um, you, what, depending on what you're looking at, it's implied that that's going to change, and then it does actually change. So that one's a little bit complicated in both, but bio art is definitely actual passage of time to create that art, and it doesn't stay the same. That's part of the passage of time, is it doesn't ever stay the same. All right, so here's the bio art I was talking about. You got the petri dish, you put whatever germ stuff goes in here, that creates the different colors, but then instead of just like, you know, scientists, they take the petri dish and they just smear it on to then see what grows to determine what the, you know, virus or issue is. Here in art, they're actually putting it in and drawing it on. And it does not look like this when they start. It develops into this, it's additive. Um, and so over time, if you have, and you have these where they'll take pictures of each day and how, the art begins to, um, that's really fast transition, right? But it develops over time. Here's another one. This is even more complex of it, but a city landscape is very clear, right? This is all gross stuff. <laughs> that's all I think of this bio art most of the time. This one's gross too. So this guy, this artist made a mold of his head and this is frozen blood. He made a mold of his head and then he filled it with his own blood. This is the artist's blood right there. Then he froze and, and say mold of his head. And then he put it out. And then over time, this melts, right? And so the passage of time and showcasing the passage of time is based on how much it melts until it, it's just a puddle of blood. And then, you know, you can't determine that anymore, how the passage of time, but you get a sense of passage of time when it's brand new. This, this first picture, this is brand new. It's at the beginning. And then you look later series, right? It's slowly melting and changing and then looks less like a face and all of that is indicative of that change of passage of time. So that's, that's, that's where we're ending. That's bio art. Um, it's, I think bio art's fascinating because there's so many different things you can do with it, but it can also get kind of gross when it moves into some of these <laughs> other areas. Um, but just know there's additive and subtractive bio art and there's additive and subtractive passage of time in general and then how you're indicating that passage of time whether you're showing time because things are growing or because things are, are dying or disappearing. But both do the same thing as they ultimately show that transition of actual, it's actual passage of time versus the earlier ones I showed you were implied passage of time. Okay, so we'll, we'll end there. And on, uh, next time we're looking at uh, unity balance and variety.